Tick tock, time to rock. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon to everyone who's watching from whatever quarantine you're under all around the world. Glad you could be with us. Uh, I know a lot of people might not have much else to do other than hang out online all night. Well, we are here in case you want to hang out, in case you want to uh, uh, explore some ideas with us. We're going to be here most nights. And with me right now, I have Braxton Hunter. Dr. Braxton Hunter, right? That's right, David. Glad to be with you. Excited about this. All right. Uh, why, don't you, uh, why don't we begin uh, by you telling everyone about yourself, uh, sort of, you know, who you are, what you do. Uh, tell us about your channel as well. Appreciate that. Yeah, I am the current president of Trinity College of the Bible and Theological Seminary, and I teach our apologetics, some of our apologetics and some of our evangelism courses there. But in terms of YouTube, I am at youtube.com slash Braxton Hunter, and the channel is called Trinity Radio. It's uh, pretty well a response channel to atheist videos, uh, but we also have some major world religion type stuff, some some Islam stuff, some uh, cults stuff and things like that, but uh, primarily uh, a response channel to atheists. Mm -hmm. And um, how's, how's, your, uh, how's your channel been doing? Uh, it's been doing great for about a year. About a year ago, I had a debate with Matt Dillahunty and uh, got a lot of atheist attention. I have a huge chunk of my audience that is atheist. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so it grew really rapidly there. And then, of course, with the help of some uh, people like Mike Winger, Cameron Bertuzzi, and John McRae, it has uh, really taken off uh, since then. And for anybody that's a YouTuber out there and kind of wondering how this works, it took me two years to get to 1,000 subscribers. And it's taken me about a year to now get to about 6,300. So there is light at the end of the tunnel. All right, cool. Uh, just wanted to check on sound. Just because Drew Beatty said I cannot hear anything, I'm assuming that is uh, a problem on his end. Does everyone else hear us? Uh, does everyone else hear us fine before we continue? I don't see anyone else complaining about sound, so I'm assuming. But I uh, just want to get a quick verify. Everyone hear us? Everyone hear us clearly? Are our sound levels about even? Hey, where's the comments? Come on. Oh, I forget. They're, we're on kind of a delay. It's about a thirty-second delay. So, <laughs> yes. okay. okay. So, yeah. so uh, okay, good. So, Cameron, Cameron Bertuzzi has got a comment here. He said, "Sound is good," and that's a uh, high praise coming from Cameron because that is uh, a yeah. that that that's a professional. That's a professional. He's man. always said that about me. He's always said I sound good. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Well, we are here to talk about the Kalam cosmological argument, as you can see in the comment from uh, Cameron here. By the way, everyone. Um, uh, if you're not subscribed to uh, Capturing Christianity, uh, awesome YouTube channel. He does uh, lots of talks, has, has debates on his channel and so on. So check that out. Also, don't do this yet. But as we proceed through this discussion of the Kalam cosmological argument with Braxton Hunter, you'll find yourself in one of three different categories. Either, wow, this guy has a lot of cool information. I'd like to know more. If you're that person, then a link to his channel is in the description box. And then so go and subscribe to his channel for much more of the stuff because he makes videos regularly. Or you'll be like, eh, I don't know, I don't know. In which case you could go either way. Or you'll be like, what the heck? I can't stand this dude. I can't stand listening to him. I would much rather listen to just David all day long. In which case, just 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 stick with me here. All right. <laughs> so Understandable. So uh, Braxton. The Kalam cosmological argument is in sort of the, the broad grouping of, of uh, I don't know, I don't know if you call them, we could call them arguments from natural theology or something like that, but arguments for the existence of God. Um, give us kind of an, an, an overview of sort of where this falls in the, in the kind of spectrum of arguments dealing with the existence of God. Yeah, so you've got um, a number of arguments that are meant to show that God exists. And this is actually a great opportunity to make something clear that is often misunderstood. And I even saw some comments related to this or asking about this in the chat already. And that is, we have these arguments, we call them theistic arguments. That is, they're arguments meant to show that God exists. But um, we always follow that. Apologists will, should always follow that with uh, a case for the resurrection or something like that to show that we're not just talking about some no-name God and we're going to leave it there uh, because we want to be preachers of the gospel as well and present the truth about Christianity. And so we follow that case for God's existence with a good resurrection case or in some other way show that Christianity is true. So in the argument that we're going to talk about tonight or any other 
theistic argument. It, there are a couple of that might could go either way, but we're really just talking about getting to that first step of what we might call a classical case, uh, classical apologetics case. That is to show that God exists. Mm-hmm. But so when people say something like, "Well, the Kalam only gets you as far as God," or whatever. Uh, yeah, that's right. I'll take, that's all I'll we're ta- to I'll do. take that. <laughs> yeah. It means atheism's yeah, false. Uh-huh. So, uh, but yeah, so you've got various kinds of, of arguments, theistic arguments. You've got design arguments. Those are, uh, t- those are called teleological arguments. You've got moral arguments. I know you had inspiring philosophies. Michael Jones on to talk about moral arguments for God's existence. Um, you've got arguments like the ontological argument, which try to show that uh, this maximally great being uh, exists in all, all these kind of things. The Kalam cosmological argument, uh, you also have contingency arguments, but the Kalam cosmological argument is in a family of arguments called cosmological arguments. And as the that title kind of indicates, this is things that have to do with the origin of the universe. Mm-hmm. So how does the origin of the universe maybe indicate a god? And so that's that's what we're doing when we're talking about cosmological cases like this. Mm-hmm. So uh, you, you pointed out that that there's a there's a family of arguments there. So uh, and and lots of the the the, the various arguments you mentioned would the, they all have these kinds of families. Like there there are lots of different versions of the ontological argument. Um, so you have um, you know if Anselm's and Descartes and uh, and uh, all the way, you know Planiga for modern versions and so on. Uh, same thing with design arguments. I mean, you know, you, you could you could you could broadly break that into you know design of the universe, like fine tuning, but also design, you know, biological design. But even within bio- biological design, you could go in tons of different directions with your argument. You could lay out tons of different premises and, and draw all kinds of different conclusions. And so we get to the cosmological argument, and you basically got a universe here. You have a big old universe and some you know, kind of broad features of our universe that we learn about uh, either philosophically or, or scientifically. We learn some things about our universe. Um, but w- with these, like with the fine tuning argument, you're talking about a, a specific, you know, specific, very specific features of our universe that it seems finely tuned for life. Uh, but with the universe, it's just, as you pointed out, things like, you know, the universe uh, existing or coming into being. And so for an individual philosopher or, or theologian or apologist, to make a case, it's how do you get from there to God? How do you get from the universe existing or coming into existence? How do you get from there to God? And different people are going to try and go about that different ways. The Kalam, the Kalam is one particular way of getting from uh, from the universe to God. So why don't you go ahead and uh, do, do, you, do you lay yours out like Craig or, or in a different way or? Yeah, I was about to say when you were talking about the different versions of, say, teleological arguments or moral arguments, um, among the YouTube crowd, the most popular forms of all these arguments are going to be William Lane Craig's, right? Yeah. I mean, he's, he's very popular. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, I like Craig's, although I think Craig has modified his a little bit as things have gone on. But I go with the one that was most popular. I see no problem with it. Uh, when I was getting into apologetics, and that is everything that begins to exist, everything that begins to exist must have a cause. Uh, the universe, premise two, the universe began to exist. So everything that begins to exist has to have a cause, and the universe is like that. The universe began to exist, so the universe must need a cause. Now, there's a couple of things, or must have a cause. There's a couple of things I want to say about this, because I realize that this can get really tricky. It can sound really philosophical and heady for people that haven't uh, encountered it before. So let me say that I think this argument is so great because it is simple enough that children, I think, can understand aspects of it, and is deep enough that philosophers can plumb its depths. So, for example, uh, both of my daughters, I have two human daughters, who, when they were about six years old apiece, each one of them came to me and said, Daddy, I know there's a God. Oh, you know there's a God? How do you know that, sweetheart? Well, there has to be a God, because if there was no God, where did all this stuff come from? And so, as six years old, children are already picking up on this sort of an idea obviously we don't want to leave it there that's not good enough but then it's it can be robust enough and complex enough that philosophers can debate this and and uh, all that sort of thing so uh, another interesting thing about this is i don't know of another argument and maybe i'm wrong maybe you would disagree with this david i don't know of another argument that has received such vitriol and hate in the youtube community from atheists from from the atheists that i've encountered and i, I don't know what to chalk that up to um, except that maybe it works. Maybe mm-hmm. it's a really good one. I don't know. But uh, but but they, they said, well, you're going to trot out that old, worn-out cosmological argument that's been debunked a thousand times. And the reality is, 
I've never seen that debunking. And as I said in my debate with Matt Dillahunty, uh, I know that's something we share in common. In my debate with Matt Dillahunty, I said, yeah, because if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And it ain't broke, folks. So, yeah, so the Kalam is everything that begins to exist must have a cause. The universe begin, began to exist, so the universe must have a cause for its existence. Now, what many people will say right there is, now, hold on a second. That means it doesn't get you to God. All it gets you to is a cause. It doesn't get you to this uh, personal creator or anything like that. So just a little uh, little pro tip here that I use is whenever I say that I'm going to bring the Kalam, I say I'm going to bring a case that begins with the Kalam mm -hmm. because every apologist always will then take that conclusion that the universe has a cause and then do a conceptual analysis or what is that cause like that gets you, I think, to God. Mm -hmm. All right. So, uh, yeah, and, and, and Craig, Craig does this as well. So Craig will defend premise one, whatever begins to exist must have a cause. Uh, he'll defend two, the universe began to exist and therefore the universe must have a cause, but then he'll go on to describe what this cause must be like, right? So you've got, we know that there's a cause of the universe, but if you know that something is causing the entire universe, then you can start to figure out things about this cause and that cause starts sounding suspiciously like God. Um, That's right. All right, so I, I went ahead and put it up on the screen in a comment, I posted my own comment. I posted a comment and then I uh, I put my own comment up on the screen. But I have here, whatever begins to exist must have a cause. Two, the universe began to exist. And three, therefore, the universe must have a cause. So everyone, uh, do you see how the conclusion there, the universe has a cause, uh, has to follow if those first two premises are true. So we don't know that it follows yet. Um, I'm, I mean, I'm assuming most of you are going, of course, whatever begins to exist must have a cause. And of course the universe began to exist. So yeah, obviously the universe does have a cause. But if you come from some sort of background where you really, really, really want to avoid the idea of the universe having a cause, then you have to you have to find a problem with uh, with either the first one or the second one and uh, and um, uh, Braxton I, I want to start formulating I want to start formulating these arguments kind of my own take because uh, because my kind of take on these is and, and yeah you know, before you even before you even uh, defend either of these premises uh, once these premises have been defended for a person to object for a person to object to these I want to say basically I have to throw out all rational thought right. If I if I if I don't know that whatever begins to exist must have a cause, if I if I if I can't say that, I, I give up. I give up on. I, yeah. I, if you're if you, Mister Atheist, are telling me that of everything I have learned, of everything I can figure out and understand about how things work, if I cannot say whatever begins to exist must have a cause, if I can't say that, I'm done. I give up. But I want to say that about about kind of all the arguments, right? Like if I can't say that, given that level of complexity in biological systems or in DNA. If I can't say that that level of, of intricate design requires an intelligent source, I, I give up. You're telling me I just need to give up on trying to reason because if I can't say that, I can't conclude anything about about anything. Um, all right, but where do you want to where do you want to start here? You want to start with a I mean yeah. premise one would be an obvious. Well, part. yeah, I think so, and I, I'd like to comment on what you just said. So, um, children, I think pretty early on come to understand this sort of cause and effect situation in the universe. It's only whenever they get older and get PhDs in philosophy or something, they start thinking something like that things can come to exist, you know, without causes. So my daughter, I ran an experiment when my daughter was about nine years old, nine months old, my, my oldest daughter, I wanted to run an experiment and see if she had developed the dexterity to catch a ball if I tossed her a ball. And so I had this, this ball and I tossed it to her and uh, it hit her in the head and she toppled over. Not a good experiment to run on your daughter, not a very Christian experiment. Um, but don't worry, it was a it was a soft ball. I mean, it wasn't a soft ball, but it was a soft ball. And she fell over. But as soon as she fell over, she did something brilliant that told me my daughter's going to grow up to be a philosopher. And that is she began to look around for what had caused her to fall over. And she saw the ball. But then she did something even more brilliant than that. She looked around for what had caused the ball to fly through the air, causing her to fall over. And she saw me with my hand up like this. And she figured it out. Mm -hmm. And so she caused something all her own in retaliation a dirty diaper, which then caused me to call out to her mother to come change the dirty diaper. Now, isn't that an elegant expression of cause and effect? Mm -hmm. And the point is that nine months old kids understand that, but when you get to a PhD in philosophy, you start thinking things like maybe things can happen without causes. So, or, yeah, or, or, real, or really, I mean, what, what, what I really want to say is, 
um, this this, this certainly this certainly isn't isn't all atheists, but the the you know a lot of the kind that you know come and post mean comments to us. Really, it's of course I take for granted all my life that whatever begins to exist must have a cause. I know that I've known it since I was you know since before I could remember thinking about anything, and of course the universe began to exist. Exist. I took science, you know, I took I took physics class. I, I know this stuff. Uh, but therefore the universe must have a cause. Oops, I didn't want to go here. So now all of a sudden I have a problem with, uh, with whatever, you know, begins to exist must have a cause. Now I have a problem with that. And so it's not, hey, there's an actual problem with the premise. It's a problem with the conclusion. And since I want to avoid the conclusion, I now have to go back and take premises that I would have granted all my life until I start, until they were used by a Christian, a Christian, uh, philosopher or a Christian, uh, apologist. As soon as the premise starts being being used by you guys, I have to I have to suddenly become skeptical about that thing that I would have never been skeptical for one second of before. Yeah, that's I think that was beautiful. And as I always say to my atheist audience, there are some very sensible folks out there. And if the shoe doesn't fit, don't wear it. Mm -hmm. If that's not you, I'm not talking to you. So um, I think one of the challenges that comes uh, pretty regularly to this is they'd say to you, David, um, hold on a second. What you seem like you're saying, David, is all of my experience bears out that things that that, you know, the things that happen or begin to exist have causes. But that's just the fallacy of composition. What that means is, you know, the fallacy of composition says, look, d uh, dogs are made by uh, made of atoms. Atoms are invisible to the naked eye. Therefore, dogs are invisible to the naked eye, which, of course, is not a sound argument. Right. It is true that atoms are not visible to the naked eye. And it is true that dogs are made of atoms. But that doesn't mean that dogs are invisible to the naked eye. And that's what we call the fallacy of composition, that what's true of the parts of something isn't necessarily true of the whole. So they'd say, yeah, it may be true, David, that everything that happens or begins to exist in the physical universe has um, some sort of a cause. But that doesn't mean that the universe itself has a cause. So the response to this would be, OK, fair enough. Um, it, still, to put a little gravy on this thing, it is relevant to say that 100% of our experience is that when things start to happen or begin to exist, there are causes, um, and, that's the, and we have zero counterexamples to this. But that's not actually why we hold this. We don't say everything that we look at seems to have causes, therefore the universe does. It's more like this. When we're talking about the universe, let's just cut to the chase with premise one. We're really talking here about the universe, ultimately. And when we're talking about the universe coming into a being from nothing, there is nothing in nothing that can cause anything. Nothing is no powers, no possibilities, no properties, no potentialities. And so there just simply isn't, you don't have a, any fertile ground there for anything to happen. Now, uh, someone might say, oh, well, yeah, but nothing might be able to, we don't know what nothing is like, so maybe nothing can do all kinds of things. But we're not talking about nothing in, in some, as a label for some thing out there. We're talking about not anything. And I love when William Lane Craig says it this way. He says, what if someone said, uh, nothing stopped the German advance? You say, oh, thank goodness the nothing was there to stop the German advance. Mm -hmm. No, come on, man. When I say nothing, I mean not anything. So the reason that we hold this premise to be true is that when we're talking about the coming into being or, or, or the happening or the beginning to exist of something, yeah, everything in our experience is that way. And the universe has to be that way too because nothing is not anything and there are no powers, potentialities, possibilities, nothing to cause anything. Mm -hmm. um, this is a little sort of silly side note here. <laughs> uh, but uh, <clears throat> we have... Uh, Writes, uh, writes Matthew Desi, uh, Desi says, uh, David, can you please do an impression of Craig, please? <laughs> yeah, please. Yeah, for some reason I did, I did, uh, in, in one video review of the Case for Christ movie, I did an impression of, uh, of Craig and, uh, and then everyone wants me to do my, uh, William Lane Craig impression. <laughs> you know, what's, you know, what's funny was, uh, I actually recorded a much longer Craig impression. I don't know if I still have it on a, on a on a drive somewhere or something like that. But for that video, I did a little fake debate between William Lane Craig and the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. And they got into this argument over what the, uh, uh, what, and Craig's going, uh, this is what scholars refer to as the holy cow argument, right? <laughs> and uh, so he was going, but in the longer version, which I didn't post, when I actually had it on, like, this is too long. I need to cut this down. So I chopped out most of it. But uh, uh, I had Craig William Lane Craig ended up doing all these like cow puns 
uh, to, to make fun of it. And so he finishes summarizing the, the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi's argument and uh, the holy cow argument. So so in case everyone, in case uh, anyone didn't see that, the, the Maharishi's argument was he has no problem with Jesus rising from the dead, provided Jesus came back as a cow. And then Craig responds, but he acts like this is a this is an actual argument. He said this is what scholars refer to as the holy cow hypothesis, where uh, the disciples showed up at the tomb and they saw it was empty and they yelled holy cow. But Hindu scholars interpreted it literally. So I'm just I'm just, just a big it's just a big joke in this in this video. Anyway, at the uh, once Craig started explaining the argument, then he starts going uh, and all I can say is where's the beef? I'm not moved at all. This is utterly improbable and he, he keeps doing every 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 cow pun i could come up with right. and then uh, he he finishes and he says so i can't go with this hypothesis there's too much at stake and uh <laughs> so, so it was really dumb i was like ah this is too much here and i chopped it all out that but, uh, video david that video is when i started watching regularly i already knew who you were and everything but i started watching regularly with that video because mark middleberg we were in corpus christi at an apologetics conference and he's like you got to see this video and it was awesome yeah yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, uh, but before premise two. Yeah. But oh, no, sorry, be, go before we go on, there is it. It already came up. Uh, people have. I see people commenting on in, in, on the chat. But it already came up. And I don't know if it was someone just trying to get us to respond to it or something like that. But can I guess? Can I guess what it is? Yeah. And 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 for some re for some reason this happens. No matter what argument we're using. When certain people hear it, they, the same people who claim to be the champions of reason and logic, they never understand what we said. And then they immediately go on to uh, pretend that we said something that we didn't say. But, but what's your prediction here? Who made God? Yeah, so, uh, so the, 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 the response that popped up was, well, if everything requires a cause, then what caused God? Now, I don't remember saying I don't remember saying that everything requires a cause. I don't remember that, but but go ahead. What, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, so this is a fair question that does come up. Um, uh, Richard Dawkins wanted to know the answer to this question. Uh, Richard Dawkins and a lot of children want to know the answer to this question. Richard Dawkins and children. And the and, and then there are some people who have just never heard the argument who, who want to know legitimately. So the answer to that question is, it's a misunderstanding of premise one. Premise one is not, as you just stated, is not everything has a cause. It's everything that begins to exist mm -hmm. must have a cause. Now, oh, hang on, hang on. First, oh, I, 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 I found the comment. I saw people responding to it. I saw people responding to it, but then I found the actual comment. So Finding Truth said, okay, I just want to make sure that he wasn't being misrepresented. But Finding, oh, no. Yeah, I think he was doing it as a joke because Finding Truth said, okay. He said, if everything has a cause, then why God doesn't have a cause, but then he put the little winking emoji. So he, I, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if he's saying, "Ha ha, I got you." Wink, or he's, uh, or or he's just joking. I, I assume he's he's joking with this. But go ahead, just because he, it's so common. He's joking. He's he's one of my moderators. Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, you gotta yeah. watch out for but, that guy. Uh, and and I was probably too snarky. I, I'm not typically that way, David. I'm coming off a bit too snarky for you. I'm sure. I, I I'm not normally like. Yeah, that. Yeah, you're gonna hurt. You're gonna hurt all my viewers' feelings. <laughs> But it is it is a fair question when someone first hears this yeah. argument. That is a natural question to ask. And so now it could sound like special pleading, even after I've just explained it, to say, oh, well, you're only doing that to get God off the hook, everything that begins to exist. And you want to say God doesn't begin to exist. But here's the thing. Um, and this kind of gets into the conceptual analysis uh, that we'll get to in a bit. But whatever stands as the cause of the physical universe must be timeless for reasons that I'm sure we'll discuss in just a moment. That means uh, sans time, you know, exists sans time. So that means, uh, and, and in a situation where you have no time, then there is no beginning or ending. Beginning and ending are only terms that make any sense in a temporal existence, in a time-based existence. So, uh, so God exists timelessly and needs no beginning. He didn't begin to exist. So that's, uh, that's the answer to that question. Mm. Yeah, so uh, guys, you... You need to be prepared for that, right? If you learn the Kalam cosmological argument really, really well, uh, this goes for every single argument. Um, I'm assuming you have the same experience here, Braxton, but when you give anything remotely resembling a moral argument, even if you say 15 times, hey, I'm not saying that atheists can't do moral things or that they can't be good or that they can't do all these nice things. I'm saying 
and then you give you know your argument I'm saying there's no objective basis for 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 doing these things right uh automatically automatically you start getting the messages ah you're saying that an atheist can't do good things without god ah, or or you can't do you can't do good things without believing in god well let me refute that i can do great things and stuff and it's like guys how do you misinterpret every single thing we say you know i think you could actually make an argument an argument based on a sort of clouding of the mind or a spiritual blindness just based on no matter how clearly you state these arguments very very not not just not to, i'm not just talking about really dumb people i'm talking about the highest levels of atheists will still completely misinterpret what you're saying and will come back with something like oh well, you said that everything has a cause so what's the cause of god right um or you're saying we're all we all we can't be moral or something like that so there, there's there's something at work here, right? Because I, I think that's a you know, you know Christopher Hitchens not to speak ill of the dead, but Christopher Hitchens was notorious for that. He would sometimes have two debates in the same week, and both debaters would bring the same moral argument, and he would misunderstand it in precisely the way you just described. And what was great, the movie Collision, which was kind of a documentary with him and Douglas Wilson, in the same movie he he does that multiple times with the same guy. Um, so yeah, I I resonate with that. And so uh, finding truth here again, he says uh, he met us at EPS, me, uh, me and vocab here. Um, all right. One quick uh, one quick uh, question here from Michelle Marie. Uh, Michelle Marie said uh, the atheists criticize because this is along the lines of the Kalam. Uh, she said the atheists criticized David after the debate with Dillahunty, stating that David is so in love with the the uh, the ignorant Kalam argument. He is just using that old straw man because he doesn't know anything else. They called it a straw man lol. <laughs> uh, I've, I've noticed that the Dillahunty crowd will call anything a straw man, right? If you just restate what he just said, that's a straw man. <clears throat> if you take what he said and then point out an obvious necessary implication of what he said, that's a straw man. But yeah, I guess they're, they're calling entire arguments there. I wasn't using the argument. I uh, what, what, what I what I said during the debate was... Uh, these uh, atheists, what the, what they've what they've done, what the, the system they've developed over time is to adjust their levels of skepticism, and so when it's something that they want to believe or something that makes them feel good, I, I, they're kind of like intellectual, like uh, hedonists or something like that, right? Like it's it's along the lines of I haven't decided what to call them yet, but if I like something and something makes me feel better about myself and about my own position and makes me feel superior to other people, then I lower my skeptic, I lower my skeptic, my skepticism down to one. And I don't need any real defense of it. I'll just, I'll just believe anything anyone says, as long as it fits in with that. But if it's something they don't like, you know, like God or Christianity or something like that, they'll dial their skepticism all the way up to 10 so that nothing can possibly qualify as evidence. And what happens then is they will start denying premises that they would otherwise grant in a heartbeat. And so they'll start denying that the universe began to exist or that whatever begins to exist must have a cause. They'll start denying these things. And guess what? One, there's nothing in there that's a straw man. That That's one, the argument can't be a, is definitely not a straw man. But two, that's exactly what they do. That is exactly precisely 100% what they do with all these arguments, no matter how clear, no matter how indisputable. If you take something that is clear and obvious and indisputable such that no rational person in the history of humanity would deny it, if you then build an argument for the existence of God based on that, all of a sudden, we can't know. We can't believe that. That's total nonsense. No, only a fool would believe that thing that's obvious. Um, all right. So those are, <laughs> yeah, those, that's, oh, those are so my much, There's so much I want to branch off with, but I know we'll never get through the Kalam if I respond to that. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> you want to go back to, uh, want to go back to, uh, well, premise two now. Yeah. So the universe began to exist. Now, uh, with this, you know, there are those guys. I, I'm one of those guys that doesn't pretend to be a scientist. I'm not a scientist. Uh, there are apologists who do not hold degrees in things related to science, but have nonetheless studied this enough autodidactically that they can talk intelligently about it. And I probably know more than a lot of people do about that sort of thing, but, but, I, but I'm not a scientist. I agree with Craig that the best defenses of the Kalam are the philosophical ones. The most clinching ones are the philosophical ones. In fact, we will get, if not in this chat, in the comments, someone will say, but the physicists don't agree with you, Braxton and David. The physicists don't go along with this. And if Sean Carroll, the physicist, doesn't go along with you on this, doesn't that say something when you guys are just apologists? Well, here's the thing. Um, physicists, not all physicists are philosophers. 
And so when it when we're coming to the philosophical defenses, uh, someone who is just a physicist is ill-equipped to respond to some of these philosophical mm -hmm. uh, arguments. And so you know you got to stay in your lane a little bit when it comes to that. So, but with premise two, my favorite defense of premise two is also one of the most deeply philosophical and difficult things to get about this whole discussion, and that is. Um, what what the skeptic will say, the, the only alternative to the universe began to exist is the universe has existed infinitely into the past. Mm -hmm. That there was no beginning. It's just always existed. Mm -hmm. And um, that the problem with that is when you think about what it means for the universe to be past infinite. Um, so past in a, a past infinite amount of time causes all kinds of problems. And I know that for many of the apologists listening, this is going to be old hat, but, but here's the thing. When we say something is infinite, we're talking about infinites. We are talking about not a really big number. You know, we colloquially mm -hmm. will say, well, there's an infinite number of grains of sand on the beaches of the world, but there's not, not there's even, an actual number, not even close. <laughs> it's an obscenely high number, but there is a number. Same with stars in the sky. No, yeah. no, no. There's not an infinite number. Yeah. There's, in fact, go ahead. Oh, I was, I was just yeah. going to say you can all, you can, you can even go down to 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 atoms or subatomic particles. The number of, the number of, atoms in the universe is around ten to the eightieth power, right? So ten to the eightieth power. So that's a number. You could sit down right now and write out ten to the eightieth power. You could you could write the number down. That is, that is the number. Uh, of atoms in the entire universe, so you could write the number down. When you're talking about inf when you're talking about infinity, you're 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 not even you're not even in the same realm. Yeah, yeah. And let let's amp it up. Let's say there is there's a multiverse and there's as many universes as as atoms you just mentioned, and then as many more atoms in all those multiverse. There's still a number. When we're talking about infinite, we're talking about there there. Th it's forever and ever and ever and ever and ever, and there is no number. There is no end. It just goes on forever. So now, if we're saying the past is like that, then we run into some serious problems. Two primary problems that I like to point out. Number one is uh, you, that means you have no first, right? There, if it's past infinite, there's no way to start. There's nowhere to start from for time to start going to get to the point we're at right now. So how would we ever get to this moment if there was no starting point, if there was no first moment? Uh, people will often say, well, yeah, but you can draw a line and put a point on that timeline. Yeah, you can. But if the past is infinite, how'd you ever get to that point? Mm -hmm. So it, a good image for this, since I realize it's kind of difficult, is imagine a hole with no bottom to it. How would you jump out of that hole? And don't say anything creative like, well, maybe I could ninja off the walls. That's not what we're saying here. There is no bottom to that hole. How do you jump out of it? You can't. So that's problem number one. Problem number two is, no matter how, let's say you could get started, no matter how far along that timeline you went, you would still have infinite to go. You'd have made no progress. And there are a lot of analogies for that. The Hilbert's Hotel is an analogy that comes up a lot, but I like one that's simpler than that. Um, and that is the infinite library. So if you had a library where there's an actual infinite number of books, and every other book is black and every other book is red, let's say you took out all the red books so that all they're left are black books. Now what number do you have? You still have infinite. You haven't changed things one bit. Uh, so if you could somehow take away half of infinite, you still have infinite. If you added three, you'd still have infinite. If you subtracted 57, you'd still have infinite. And so you run into these mathematical absurdities, but the practical cash value of that is if you were trying to go along the timeline to get to this moment we're inhabiting in this live stream right now, you could never do it. You could never arrive at this moment. And so the past cannot be infinite like that. Uh, if we got to this moment. Yeah. And so uh, it's basically if it, it, the uh, no matter how you look at premise two, that uh, the universe began to exist. And again, no, there's I mean, one, once we found out about something like the Big Bang, uh, you wonder why anyone would question it. Of course, you already had you already had the Kalam before that, before we could show that sort of thing scientifically, you already had the the problem of pointing out um, the, the impossibility of traversing an actual infinite. Uh, so it seems that you have like this cumulative case from every relevant discipline here, right? We know scientifically, right, just from studying cosmology, that the universe began to exist. If that wasn't enough, we know philosophically that the universe must have a beginning. If that didn't, if, if that didn't work, we know mathematically, based on the absurdity of, of, you know, working with actual infinites, which you would have if the universe, I mean, infinite collections of things like infinite days or however you want to describe it. And so 
everything everything we use in our reasoning to come to a conclusion about something uh, about the universe or something like that that's what you got right you got science you got math and you got philosophy those are the areas we can go to all of them would say of course the universe began to exist suddenly an atheist jumps in there wait a minute you're using that to show something about the existence of god uh nope i'm a skeptic i'm a skeptic convince me and oh by the way nothing you say I will ever be allowed by me as evidence, but go ahead. Now I'm going to sit back. I'm going to be a skeptic. Prove to me that the universe began to exist, but I'm going to reject all the evidence that you get. Yeah, and a good live example of what you say, you brought this up again now, so I'll say it, is um, this common refrain we hear that I need a demonstration. I need, it needs, you need to demonstrate to me a God. Well, what do you mean? Do you mean I have to have it in a beaker? Well, no, I, I, but I am saying something science if not science. It needs to be some demonstration. Well, what does that look like? Well, I don't know, but if God does exist, he would know, and he should be able to give it to me. All right, what about all this evidence? No, that doesn't convince me. Well, what about all this evidence? Oh, no. by, by, they get by to the way, that, the demonstration. By, by the way, that, that's, that's almost a direct quote from Dillahunty, right? I, mean, I, I've, yeah. I've, I haven't seen him say that, but I, I've heard, I, I've heard uh, people yeah. point out that he says that. He says... Uh, Basic because the the only clip, but before before now before like I was having a debate with him, um, but you know so in the past I'd only watched I believe I only, I'd only watched one clip of uh, Dilla Hunty ever uh, before actually agreeing to debate him, and that was a clip from his debate with Mike Lacona where Mike Lacona said something along the lines of, uh, "Hey, if I if my if I came up to you and and I was beheaded in front of you, right in front of you, my head gets chopped off and." And, uh, and, you know, I'm clearly, I'm clearly, I've clearly been beheaded. And then all of a sudden, several days later, I come back and I appear to you and I'm talking to you and I start telling you secret things that I couldn't have known. I, I said, hey, you know, I saw these things in some sort of afterlife and stuff. Would you believe in the supernatural then? He goes, no. And so, right. And, and, and another one like that is in 2015 with Matt Slick. Slick asked him, what if someone parted an ocean in Jesus? Name? We're not even talking about the Red Sea here. If some, what if someone parted an ocean in Jesus name? Would you believe something supernatural had happened then? The answer is no. And Slick asked him, well, what would it take? He said, I don't know what it would take. But, so God, but, 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 God, but, God, but God knows. Is that where you were getting at? So, well, yeah, he does say that. Yeah. yeah. And so what I what I said was in my uh, in my the first one of the first questions in my question and answer time with him was I said, you've said you have to have a demonstration, right? Yeah. What is that demonstration? And then he and then he said the whole thing about God. And I said, yeah, but if God, if Jesus appeared to you on the stage right now, you could say, well, that was just a you know, that was just in my head or something like that. Well, yeah, I would say that. So but here's the other side of that, David, that I've noticed in thinking about I've thought about that debate and, and his work a lot is all right. But then you say you don't believe that Cartesian certainty is even possible. Mm -hmm. And I understand that. I'm, I'm sympathetic to that. I, I think in most cases, at least, Cartesian certainty is for the birds. All right, so that means that you agree that we can't give you Cartesian certainty and shouldn't have to, and nothing else can give you that about anything, right? Mm -hmm. That's right. Okay, well then, what kind of demonstration are you expecting yeah. Short of Cartesian certainty. Mm -hmm. it, and what that res here's what that results in, and it kind of hits at what you brought out in your opening statements in the morality debate, or the ethic, whatever it is, is this thing of, I then get to be the arbiter of, w of whether I'm going to allow something to meet the level of demonstration. Mm -hmm. And my response to him ultimately was, you know something, it may be that God does know that given your libertarian free will... There is there isn't anything that will convince you because of the epistemology that you've structured. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, uh, yeah, I uh, to to help people understand because uh, to be clear, Dillahunty is not the the only uh, atheist speaker who who does this. Um, I've long believed that that all of the popular uh, atheist speakers and so on are actually doing this. What's interesting is now they're finally admitting it. So uh, I don't know if you saw. Uh, uh, Richard Dawkins' interview with Peter Bogosian, where uh, Peter Bogosian asked him, um, "What if God did exist? What evidence could God give you that would that would show you that He existed?" And Dawkins said, "Well, you know, years ago I would have said, you know, if I walk outside and then there's some big booming voice and it says Richard Dawkins, believe in me, I, I would point to things like that and say, you know, why doesn't God just do that if He wants me to believe?" He said, "But I've come to realize since then that if that happened, I would just conclude that it's a hallucination." And so they start yeah. they start going along the lines of all these different things they've been saying for years would convince them and realizing that none of that would convince them. And then they even got to the point where if if uh, if 
Richard Dawkins saw a message written out in the stars, Richard Dawkins, believe in me, he would simply appeal to powerful aliens who are trying to, to trick him. And so what you find out is that these guys who for years have been going around going, uh, your evidence doesn't convince me. Show me the evidence. I want to go where the evidence points have constructed a methodology that is impervious to evidence, right? So they've constructed a methodology that is impervious to evidence. Dawkins does it. Bogosian does it. Um, Dillahunty clearly does it. Uh, Michael Shermer has what, what what's called Shermer's Last Law, where uh, powerful enough aliens would be indistinguishable from God. And I pointed out in my debate with him, well, if, if aliens, if powerful aliens would be indistinguishable from God, then God is indistinguishable from powerful aliens. I asked him, what could God do to give you any kind of evidence? And there's nothing. He couldn't come up with anything. The reason is, I mean, just imagine, God shows up, he starts blasting lightning bolts around. Believe in me, believe in me. Well, how do I know that's not a powerful alien? They've constructed a methodology that is immune to evidence. But at the same, and I, I think you could actually make a rule out of this. I haven't decided what to call it yet. I want to make a video on this, but it's basically this. If, if Richard Dawkins is going to reject any evidence, no matter what, then Richard Dawkins rejecting your argument tells you nothing about the quality of the argument, right? If, if, it's, <laughs> if, it's, if it's a slam dunk, foolproof argument, he's going to reject it if it's for the existence of God, because he's already acknowledged it doesn't matter what the evidence is, he's going to reject it. And if, it's, if your argument is garbage, he's going to reject it. So either way, he's going to reject it. Him rejecting it tells you nothing. And so atheists who, you, yeah, atheists you, who rely on Dawkins to do their reasoning for them, they really need to step back and say, wait a minute, his, his rejecting these arguments tells me nothing. I, I need to look at this stuff myself. Yeah, you, you're speaking my language here because that was my approach in the Dill Hunty debate. Mm -hmm. That was the approach that Michael Jones took in his debate with Dill Hunty. I, I said in my opening or in my uh, uh, first rebuttal, look, if um, this is, I, I brought out that Lycona thing, I brought out the Matt Slick thing, mm -hmm. I brought out this is what Dill Hunty says. So if you would believe, if a notion was parted in Jesus' name, if you would believe if someone's head was decapitated and they came back and told you about, if you would believe on the basis of those things, then Matt Dillahunty's opinions about what counts as good and bad evidence should have absolutely no sway on you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So anyway. Yeah. So uh, yeah, and when I try to explain this to someone who doesn't, who kind of doesn't get what's going on, um, I point out. Uh, all right. So suppose imagine that I were a a metaphysical solipsist. A metaphysical solipsist is a person who believes that he's the only thing that exists. Right. So he's sitting back. If I were a metaphysical, if I were a metaphysical solipsist, I would be sitting here right now in this discussion. But I wouldn't believe that this computer exists, that this camera exists, that. Uh, that uh, that Braxton exists, that any of you exist anywhere outside of my own mind. Uh, all of this, if I were a metaphysical solipsist, I would believe that all of this is just a sort of uh, fiction, fictional world that I've invented in my own head to keep myself entertained for because I exist for all eternity maybe and I just that's I'm the only thing that exists and I get bored and so I've invented this this sort of view now if someone adopts that system to where everything you're saying everything I look around me and see it's all a figment of my own mental entertainment system what evidence can any of you give me that I'm wrong or that what evidence can you give me that you exist and the answer is there's nothing at all that you could even possibly say to convince me that you exist. Because anything you say, any argument you give, I'm automatically interpreting that as just you're a fictional character in my mind that is saying that. So there, you, you're not proving anything. And so it's no... Of course I would say that. Yeah. And so no, you're, it's no evidence at all. Nothing you can say could provide evidence against my position. That's what happens if you uh, invent a a system that is impervious to evidence. All your modern atheists have done have expanded that to where it's just the universe, right? And anything that you, any evidence you could possibly give me of anything beyond our universe, I'm simply going to interpret as something within our universe. And I'm not going to allow anything to qualify as evidence of the supernatural. And and that that's enough for them to have come up with that method. And so guess what? Once you grant that, once you grant that method, and that's your method, well, guess what? Nothing can count as evidence against your position, just as nothing can count against the position of a metaphysical solipsist. Nothing can possibly count. So here it's it's just, anyone can do this. Anyone can invent a methodology that is impervious to evidence. Here's my position. I want to I want to hold on to this position, and I'm going to come up with a methodology that doesn't allow anything else to qualify as evidence. Anyone can do that, but the fact that that is the dominant 
the dominant position within atheism now. You've invented a method that is impervious to evidence, and anyone could do it. If you have a method, as a rule, if you have a method that could be used to defend anything, any position, no matter how ridiculous, you probably need a new method. Yeah, and, and on the heels of that, and I know we need to get back to the Kalam because we're running out of time, but, but here's the thing. Since I've got this massive platform called Act 17 Apologetics right now to say something, mm -hmm. this is something I really want atheist YouTubers and people who listen to atheist YouTubers to get right now. And that is, if you're looking for some little nook and cranny way to wiggle out of the force of one of these arguments, are you really looking for truth? Yeah. What I mean, that, that doesn't, it's kind of like you've been kind of imaging this throughout this conversation, which is, man, that's the impossibility of past infinite. I mean, that works for me. Or yeah, noth nothing comes from nothing. That works for me. It, you're the other end of that. You're like, hey, if it seems like that's the case, let's go with it. Whereas I see this wi every little, if we can f find one pinhole to wiggle out of, let's do it. Man, let's look for truth. And if it looks like this is the truth, let's go with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yep, I agree. I agree completely. Not to preach. Yeah. Oh, you can preach. You can preach. It's a Christian <laughs> apologetics channel. Praise the Lord, man. <laughs> All right. So uh, uh, you've defended premise one and premise two. Uh, anything else you wanted to add? Well, there, there, we, there's, I, there's also where you where you can go once you get to the conclusion. Yeah. So so once you get to the conclusion that the universe has a cause, you say, OK, well, that's not really impressive, Braxton. All you did was show that there's a cause. Big deal. Um, and where you would go from there is, is kind of like this. You'd say, all right, look. The universe is made of three things in a very general way, and that is time, space, and matter. Um, time, space, and matter. So, and matter and energy are interchangeable. So, time, space, and matter. So, you'd say, okay, well, whatever brought the the universe, by which we mean time, space, and matter. And by the way, it doesn't matter if it's a multiverse, doesn't matter if it's a vacuum model, doesn't matter if it's a cyclical model. Whatever it is, whatever brought time, space, and matter into existence can't be in those categories because those are the things we're trying to explain. So if you find those things, you're still talking about the thing we're trying to explain. So that would mean that it is timeless. And some people would use the term eternal, but they don't mean by that everlasting because everlasting is a, is a temporal term. So God is everlasting because anytime there's time, he's everlasting there, but God is eternal or timeless sans the physical universe. Um, he's spaceless and, or the cause would be spaceless and not made of physical matter. Now, that means it's a spaceless, timeless, non-material cause. What else can we say about it? Uh, well, we could say that it has to be sufficiently powerful, and that's just going with what it would have to be to bring a universe into existence. I'm not saying it's omnipotent. I'm just I'm going I'm being really conservative with this. I'm just saying it has to be sufficiently powerful to bring about the universe. Otherwise, it didn't bring about the universe. And it, and here's the here's the catch. There are things that are spaceless, timeless, and non-material the laws of logic, perhaps, things like that. Um, but those things don't have causal powers. They can't do anything. So you need something that can do something. Now, this is, this is where I differ a bit from Craig, although I think Craig would agree with this. Uh, I can't speak for him. But Craig would say, look, it has to be able to decide to create the universe from nothing. You have to go from a... a so you've got kind, types of causation. You have event-event um, causation, like my punching my computer screen breaks my computer screen. It's an event that leads to another event. You have state event cause, or you have state state causation, like a, a log resting on a frozen pond. There's a state leading to another state. But what we have here is state event causation. You have a state of timeless nothingness leading to an event, the beginning of the universe. An agent causation, personal agent causation, would fill that role. But I think we can actually go a step further, and, and here's where I would go with this. Whatever the initial cause must have been, must have had libertarian freedom. And the reason I say that is, and it means they had to have free will, because there was no prior determinism to work on it, to make it do anything, and it wasn't random because it resulted in a workable cosmos. So it would have to have libertarian freedom. Well, what sort of things have free will? Personal agents do. So there's a couple of reasons to think it's a personal agent, and there are no good alternatives. And it seems like this must be the explanation. So you have a spaceless, timeless, non-material, sufficiently powerful, exceedingly wise, personal agent, and that is what every Jew and every Christian has always meant when they look at Genesis 1, in the beginning, God. Mm -hmm. So, timeless, spaceless, immaterial, personal agent. That's why we said it starts to sound suspiciously like God. You start looking into what sort of cause would be required to create 
the universe. Although, let, let me let me ask you this. I've always wondered. I, I know yeah. I, I know the question. The the the, the it, it's the claim is sufficiently powerful to create the universe, or just really really powerful, uh, powerful beyond anything we can fathom because it could create the universe, but not um, the the claim usually isn't omnipotent. But I I've just been thinking to if you could bring an entire universe into existence out of nothing, right? Not like not just working around the universe or you're doing something with the universe or tinkering with the universe, but actually saying, okay, there's nothing here. Bam, a universe. If that's not um, if that's not in the category of omnipotence, I don't know what is, right? Like if, if, if I were to come up with some test of omnipotence, take nothing right. and turn it into a universe. That would be, okay, all right. You seem omnipotent now. Yeah, the response to that, I think, and I know you know all this, but the response to that is typically, well, how do you know it's not a cause that could create one universe but not 10 billion universes? Mm. And so there would be something it couldn't do. But I'm with you. But, you know, I mean, here's the thing. If we've got a spaceless, timeless, non-material, sufficiently powerful, exceedingly wise, personal agent, atheism is false. Mm -hmm. Now, it's it's it, Dillahunty, back to I, We're beating up on Dillahunty. I don't mean to do that. It's just that I prepared for a debate with him for a year. You just debated him. But here's the thing. He often says, how do you know that's a god? How do you know it's not a group of universe-creating pixies that did all of that? That, 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 okay. that, one, that one goes back to Hume. Hume, Hume used something similar uh, right. to that. And it, so I've, I've called it the pixie parade. I've, I've grouped. Uh, one of our listeners is cataloging all the things. So you've got a computer. You've got a pixie. You've got a cheese sandwich. You, all these spaghetti, spaghetti monster. You've got all these things that could have caused the universe. So here's, here's the problem. Um, okay, let's go with your spaceless, timeless, non-material, sufficiently powerful group of pixies. But Occam's razor, the principle that says you shouldn't multiply explanatory variables beyond what's necessary, would have you cull away all but one of those pixies. So now you've just got a spaceless, timeless, non-material, sufficiently powerful, exceedingly wise, singular, universe-creating pixie. You just described God and called God a pixie. So welcome to theism, you pixie theist. <laughs> <laughs> you pixie theist. <laughs> that, that's a good title for a video. Yeah, Matt Dillahunty, yeah. the pixie I theist. Should do that. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, so we guys, you have any questions about the Kalam cosmological argument? I know uh, Hexata sent me a couple questions ahead of time. Should we jump into those? Maybe if we jump into those, they'll come along with other questions. Or? Okay. So uh, yeah, um, and Hexata had some kind of uh, technical technical questions, but we'll go ahead and see what Hexata came up with. All right. So here we go. I'll go ahead and read the whole thing, and then we could sort of take them one at a time. Um, and I know it's partly covering us up, ladies and gentlemen. It's a big, uh, it's a big, uh, big thing, and you can't read it if I don't make it big. Um, some objections. So I basically sent out to uh, channel members here and so on beforehand. Uh, hey, you have any questions about uh, things we're going to be talking about this week? And these were the questions on what we're talking about right now. Um, some objections and questions regarding the Kalam cosmological argument. One, does the argument work without assuming a dynamic theory of time, a theory? Two, in what sense is God actually infinite, and why doesn't that pose a problem for the argument? The most potent version of this objection might be one that applies. And by the way, guys, if, if any of this is confusing, we will, we will, we will be breaking, we'll break it down. We'll break it down exactly what he's saying. And you can all get this. Uh, the most potent version of, the, of this objection might be one that applies the concept of of actual infinity to the number of propositions known by an omniscient God, my proposed reply would be that God's knowledge is not ultimately divisible to discrete propositions, but rather is the direct knowledge of the truth as an all-encompassing unified whole, even if it may be useful for us to analyze it by dividing his knowledge to propositions. And three, the argument is credited to medieval Islamic philosophy, but apparently there is an earlier version by the Christian, though possibly heretical thinker, John Philoponus. Have you studied his version? Should Christians reclaim the credit for this argument from medieval Muslim philosophers? All right, just going to the first one here. Does the argument work without assuming a dynamic theory of time? A theory. So uh, for, for people who are uh, confused about that, you have A theory of time and B theory of time. I'm not an expert on this, but, uh, and, um, and Braxton, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, A theory, this is why he calls it dynamic, is the view that we're, we're in the present right now and the past is, is, is past and the, the future hasn't gotten here yet. And so things are changing. We're sort of moving along. We're sort of moving along with time. And B theory of time 
uh, again, anyone can correct me here because I'm not positive about what I'm saying. B theory of time is more along the lines of, no, there's just one, t time just is, it's just one constant uh, present. I think it's called eternalism. But it, it, the sort of uh, succession of time, of events and so on, that's kind of an illusion to us. It's sort of a psychological, uh, it's sort of a psychological illusion. It seems like we're moving through time, but it's all just, you know, it's all just one, one, one big, massive present. And so the, the, the question is, do you need something like the A theory that we're actually moving through time? And so it makes sense to go back and talk about, you know, things that happened in the past or something like that. Or... Uh, does it work on on either theory? <clears throat> yeah. So yeah. So simply put, and I'm not restating. I'm only restating this to get it clear in my mind. Mm -hmm. So the A theory says that the past was real, but it's not real now. Like you can't go to 1964. It's not real now. It was real. It's not real now. The present is real, but won't be real later. And the future will be real, but it's not real yet. Whereas the B theory says it's all real. Um, and this is where you get trouble with using tenses to describe it, but it's as though there's a snow globe with the entire timeline in it, mm. and, and it's just all there simultaneously. Um, but again, tenses get problematic. Now, interestingly, uh, I, I want to believe in the B theory. I really do, because it's only, as a science fiction fan, it's only on the B theory that time travel is actually possible, because there's really a past to go to, or really a future to go to right now. So all your science fiction stuff rests on a B theory of time. Uh, the, the, the proposed problem that the questioner is thinking of is the fact that the A theory, so the, it has to do with the problem of a past infinite universe. So you couldn't develop a, an infinite by um, addition, consecutive addition. So in other words, if you started counting one, two, three, four, and you lived forever, you could never count to infinity for the reasons we talked about earlier. There's not really an infinite, actual infinite number of grains of sand on the beaches or whatever. You could never count to infinity. You'd always be approaching it, but you'd never be arriving at it. But the B theory is supposed to pose a, pro pose a problem because here the infinite didn't come about through a successive addition, it simply is instantiated entirely all at once, uh, this infinite, this infinite uh, system. Now, uh, for a long time, people thought that was a real problem, but there's a great, uh, there's been some great work done on this. Robert Coons was recently on Capturing Christianity, which is uh, Cameron Bertuzzi, who we spoke about earlier, uh, his channel, and he presented what is known as the Grim Reaper Paradox. And the Grim Reaper Paradox um, is pretty complicated. I don't know if you want me to get into it, but the point of it is there is a version of it that has to do with why the, it poses a problem for past infinites uh, amount of time, and there's a version of it that has to do with uh, a past infinite series of events. That second one that has to do with the past infinite series of events illustrates that if you, you can't have a past infinite universe even on the B theory of time, because you would run into a flat contradiction, not just an absurdity, but a flat contradiction. I'll summarize it as briefly as I can. But basically what, what he says is, all right, imagine you've got these Grim Reapers. They're called Grim Reapers because in the other version that has to do with time, they kill a guy. This is the less violent version. Uh, I, I really just uh, encourage people to go listen to that episode on capturing Christianity with Robert Coons. But uh, say you have an infinite past infinite series of Grim Reapers. And each one of them has a piece of paper. And, he, and, and, and his only job, every, every Grim Reaper's job is he has passed a piece of paper from the previous Grim Reaper in the series, and he's supposed to look and see, does it have a number on it already? And if it doesn't have a number, or maybe it's if he's supposed to put his number, but if it doesn't have a number, he puts his number and passes it on. And then the next Grim Reaper will check to see if it has a number. And if it does, he passes it on. If it doesn't, he writes the number. People will have to listen to this a couple of times, I think, to get it. The question is, if you get to, let's say the end of the series is 100 AD. When you get to 100 AD from, AD from this past infinite series of Grim Reapers, and trust me, I know this is totally weird, um, d what number is going to be on that page, or is there going to be a number on that page? Well, you end up with a contradictory result, because <laughs> whichever Grim Reaper first put a number on the page, there was already an infinite number before that one that didn't put the number on the page, if any of them did. And you say, well, the first one did. Well, there is no first one. It's a past infinite. So what you end up with is whenever that Grim Reaper puts the number on, the, when you get to the end, you both have a number on the page because surely an infinite number of Grim Reapers would have put the number on the page at some point. But you end up with, no, there's not a number on the page because there was an infinite number that 
didn't write a number. So you end up with an exact contradiction. And that's really weird. I just encourage you to go watch the Capturing Christianity. But what it shows is that even on the B theory, you still can't get to an actual infinite. So where it was once thought that this wouldn't work, I think this now shows with the Green Reaper paradox, uh, that second version, it works even with the B theory. So what was the second question that was raised? Um, Because this is the one I really get excited about, I think. All right, let me put this back up here. Um, Question two was, in what sense is God actually infinite? And why doesn't that pose a problem for the argument? So just uh, here at the beginning, everyone, the if, if you wonder what's going on here, um, part of the Kalam cosmological argument is that you start running into all kinds of uh, problems, logical problems, mathematical problems, and so on. If you start talking about an actual infinite collection of something, you start ending up with all sorts of mathematical absurdities and that the philosophical claim that you can't traverse an actual infinite uh, series. And so the question that arises is, well, isn't God infinite? And so is that is that a problem? Um, and so the initial response is, well, no, that's not a problem because we're not talking about God being an infinite collection of something, right? So we're not talking about God being an infinite collection. But then it goes on here. Um, he says, the most potent version of this objection might be one that applies the concept of actual infinity to the number of propositions known by an omni- by an omniscient God. So in other words, the, the number of propositions that God knows or um, the number of ideas God has, wouldn't those be infinite? Wouldn't God have an infinite collection of ideas? And if so, wouldn't all the, the problems associated with, uh, with the library example or with Hilbert's hotel or something like that, wouldn't those, uh, wouldn't those yeah. same objections apply to God and how do you get around this problem? So a few years ago, I came up with this on my own. You know, it's one of those things we all, as when you're thinking philosophically, you come up with stuff that other people have thought of, and you think you're the first one to ever think of it. And a few years ago, I thought of this on my own, and I thought, oh my gosh, I think I accidentally just just came upon a philosophical argument that proves open theism is true. Open theism is the view that God does not have exhaustive knowledge of future events. Um, and there are various versions of open theism, but but in whatever version you take, ultimately God doesn't exhaustively know all future events. Um, I reject open theism, and so I thought this is this is uh, this is trouble because if if the future is going to be always approaching but never arriving at an actual infinite number of future events, but we are going to live forever, then doesn't that mean that God must have an actual infinite number, an actual infinite knowledge of future events? And doesn't that cause a problem because God's knowledge would then have to cross an actual infinite? Well, since you can't cross an actual infinite, God may know a whole lot about the future, but maybe he doesn't know everything. And I was really disturbed about this for a while. I thought I had proved open theism, and I thought I was going to have to bite the bullet and be an open theist. But then I came across some journal articles that revealed to me that I'm, I'm a dummy again thinking I've thought of something nobody ever thought of. And that there are great responses that are pretty simple, and it has to do with this. So there are potential infinites, and then there are actual infinites. An actual infinite is some, is an infinite number of something that would exist in reality, and we don't think there are. That's what we were talking about with sand and stars and atoms and all that. But a potential infinite is you can conceptually imagine dividing a line an infinite number of times, right? So it, that, that infinite exists conceptually, but uh, it doesn't exist in reality. So there's a couple of things, and the questioner kind of hit toward this. Number one, God's knowledge of all future events would be potential, would be a potential infinite knowledge, simply because that's what it means for something to be potential and a potential infinite, is that it exists conceptually rather than yet exists actually in, in reality. But there's a second issue to this, and this is what the questioner I think was hitting toward. And that is an omniscient being. It has all the knowledge immediate, like simultaneously. So in the in, sans the creation of the physical universe, God exists timelessly, and he's not thinking through, I'm going to create the universe, I'm going to create the universe, I'm going to create it now. And he's not reasoning through when would be the best time. We have to think that way because that's actually a process of learning where we think through what we already know to arrive at a conclusion about what we should do. God simply has all that knowledge instantaneously, and here's where the rubber meets the road. So he doesn't have to think through things. He just knows it as a set. 
So the example that was given in the journal articles that I think is great is you and I, David, and all of the listeners are currently aware of all the numbers between 1 and 100, all the whole numbers between 1 and 100. So if I ask you what number comes after 47, you don't have to cross all the numbers prior to 47 to then arrive at, oh, now I know it's 48. You simply instantly know that it's 48. The same as if I asked you what are all the 10s, 10, 20, 30, or what's the next 10 after 30, 40. You just know that. And God's knowledge would, of the future events would be like that. It would be a potential infinite, and he knows it as a set, so he doesn't have to cross an infinite to arrive at an answer. He just knows it instantly and can access it like that. And I think that pretty well resolves the problem, and I still uh, happily reject open theism. Oh, glad you reject open theism. <laughs> Uh, all right, Hexitas, you can let us know what you think of that. And let me go ahead and finish. Uh, I didn't I didn't read his entire second point. So uh, Hexitas said, my proposed reply would be that God's knowledge is not ultimately divisible to discrete propositions, but rather is the direct knowledge of the yep. truth as an all-encompassing unified whole, even if it may be useful for us to analyze it by dividing his knowledge to propositions. Uh, and three, finally, the argument is credited to medieval Islamic philosophy, but apparently mm -hmm. there is an earlier version by the Christian, though possibly heretical thinker, John Philoponus. Have you studied his version? Should Christians reclaim the credit for this argument uh, from medieval Muslim philosophers? So as far as I know, I think he had a heretical view of the Trinity. I think it was uh, declared heretical uh, because of that. But he was responding to the pagans of his time, many of whom, uh, like, like atheists recently, claimed that the universe has existed from all eternity. Um, and John came up, uh, his, his portion of the argument was to claim that, uh, that it, it's impossible to traverse an, a, an actual infinite. And so he used that to claim that the universe couldn't have possibly um, existed from all eternity. So what, 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 do, you, what do you think of that claim? So, the, you know, cos cosmological arguments have been around for a long time. I think he's specifically talking about the Kalam or what we call the Kalam. But um, there's even stuff in Plato that we could look at as maybe a, a cosmological argument of a sort. So uh, th this is a debate that's happened, you know, uh, again, back to Dillahunty. Um, he had, I'd heard him say many times, and many other atheists had said it too, that the original Kalam or the original, one of the original cosmological arguments said everything that has a cause, or everything uh, must have a cause. But then they realize later, oh shoot, that means God would have a, need to have a cause. So we got to retool this and come up with everything that begins to exist. And he actually thought he was taking up for me with a questioner in our debate. And he said that. And I said, hold up. I said, uh, do, can you demonstrate that to me? <laughs> can you demonstrate that the original Kalam said everything that exists yeah. has a cause? Yeah, cla yeah. Cla claims aren't <laughs> evidence, Matt. Right, Claims aren't right. evidence, so give me evidence for your claim. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, and he said, "Well, maybe I can send it to you later." And I never received that. Shocker. But, um, but, but the, but the thing about it is, ultimately, my point is this: I don't care if a heretic came up with it. I don't care if a Muslim came up with it. I don't know who made my iPhone, but my iPhone is awesome, and I use it all the time. Mm -hmm. um, all truth is God's truth, and if a Muslim came up with an argument that works, if a heretic came up with an argument that's true, that is the property of God, and that heretic stumbled upon it, or that Muslim stumbled upon it. But if it's true, it's true, and I don't mind uh, if, you know, I'm, I'm happy to call it the Kalam. It's interesting, maybe for someone to do a PhD dissertation related to, uh, was there a, something like the Kalam prior that was Christian? Um, and I went through all that when I was preparing for the Dillahunty thing. I don't remember exactly right now, but um, I ultimately don't care in the sense of, do, do we need to claim it back? Do I, mm -hmm. do, is it going to hinder how I use it? That's actually a question I wonder about the, to get your response on, David. Does it bother you that it's a that it that, that, that Muslims popularize this at least? Um, no, not at all. Not not. I mean, in the same way. Uh, look, if if Aristotle comes up with a correct point, then Aristotle came up with a correct point. All, all truth is ultimately God's truth, and so if he gets to something that's correct, it's not. Oh crap! This was a this was a a Greek philosopher. I can't. I can't use that. Um, or if Plato came up with something. If Plato comes up with something that's right, and guess what? There, you know, the early centuries of Christians all the way up through the medievals, they understood that. They were they were happy to. Hey, if, if Plato makes a good point, Plato makes a good point. If Aristotle makes a good point. If he's breaking things down and and coming up with concepts that helps us to clarify issues and so on, then cool. 
And so what you, what you have historically is we know that, uh, that parts of the Kalam, um, the, the sort of key step that, that the universe uh, hasn't existed for all eternity, it had a beginning, um, that goes back before uh, Muslim philosophers were using it. Then Muslims took it and oh, if the universe began to exist, then the universe must have a cause. So they, they ran with it and used it as, as part of their natural theology. I say, I say, great. <laughs> if you guys come up with a with a good argument, I don't care what you come up with a good argument for. If you come up with a good design argument, awesome. If you come up with, uh, with any kind of argument, uh, that's good. But what what you have, and I think this is the reason for it, is uh, I've seen Muslims say, "Ah, oh, you guys are using our argument," and that shows that they're not thinking like us, right? They're not thinking, "Oh, if someone comes up with a good argument, cool. I don't care what your background is. If you come up with a good argument, you come up with a good argument, right?" They're thinking this argument is ours. No one gets to use it. Um, or, ha, huh, you're admitting that, that, that we're brilliant. I mean, this is hilarious because you have entire Muslim dawah groups in the UK who do nothing but use William Lane Craig's materials, right? They just use them. They, 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 they use all his arguments to argue for the existence of God. And then they say that Islam is true. Um, but they want to say this with, with the Kalam. And so I, I think that, I think the point, I think the point that the, uh, that, uh, Hexitas is trying to make is, if a Muslim is like that, right? And so this wouldn't apply to most Muslims. I'm, th I'm thinking, I'm thinking, lots of lots of Muslims out there are thinking, yeah, you know, you guys have an argument, cool. If we have an argument, cool. Then we, you know, we can all share arguments if they're, because keep in mind, ladies and gentlemen, Muslims and Christians and Jews, if you have an argument for the existence of God, we would all agree with that argument, right? We, we if you have a, if you have a sound argument for the existence of God, which we generally believe that there's something called natural theology, right? That that that's in the Quran that, that you can look around at the world and you can draw draw conclusions about the one who created the world, right? <clears throat> Jews believe that, Christians believe that, Muslims believe that. So, a Jew or a Christian or a Muslim would be capable if if our if 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 God exists and has created us with the ability to do that, we would all be capable of looking around at the world figuring something out about the world and figuring out how to argue something about our creator. Well, it shouldn't matter which person came up with it. But I think what Hexitas is saying is, if a Muslim wants to pull that stunt, hey, you're using our argument, William Lane Craig. Well, no, that argument, uh, the, the, the key step in that argument actually goes back before Muslims. So if you want to play this game, then you guys stole it from a heretical Christian. And so <laughs> yeah. it's a heretical Christian yeah. argument. You guys stole it. Uh, but yeah, I'm like you. I, I I don't I don't I don't care if a Muslim came up with it, a, 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 a Orthodox Christian, a heretical Christian. If the argument is sound, it, it's like just because you're wrong about something doesn't mean you're wrong about everything, right? You could be wrong about this. You could be wrong about you know God being a, a Trinity. You could be wrong about something like that. But um, if you you could be if you, you want to say we're wrong and we want to say you're wrong about this or that, it doesn't mean that we're wrong about everything. And so. Yeah, and, and this goes back to a fundamental point that I think should be capped off in this discussion. That is, we are aware that this just gets you to God, and and that as far as that goes, a Muslim could use this, a Christian could use this, a Jew could use this. But here's the thing about it: we then, a, a Christian apologist who's interested in presenting the gospel, will follow this with a case for the resurrection or the divinity of Jesus or in some other way the truth of the Christian specific message. And, um, and, and, and now there are, you might say, well, if you're going to give a case for the resurrection, then why, why wouldn't you just only give the case for the resurrection and not do this theistic argument dance? Well, there are apologists like that. Our mutual friend, Mike Lycona, um, is a type of apologist that doesn't typically give theistic arguments. He just goes with the resurrection and the idea is, if I can show that Jesus rose from the dead, the best candidate for that is God and you're off and running. The reason why people like me and Craig and, and others would start with an argument for God's existence is because to say that God raised Jesus from the dead is a whole lot easier if you've already shown there's a God to raise Jesus from the dead. But it's just different methodologies. But the case, an apologetic case, a good apologetic case, should have the goal of, I mean, what's the point of showing that Christianity is true but that people would believe unto Christ and become Christians? And so I think it should involve a Christian-specific message. Usually that's going to look like a case for the resurrection. Um, all right. Uh, just wanted to deal with some point because a bunch of people said that they're like, uh, I think they're calling them porn bots, people posting uh, messages. Guys, I'm seeing zero of those. Uh, I've blocked uh, all of that. Any Anyone posting links. In fact, that's why there were 
there are some people who don't want you uh, having any sort of reasonable discussion about Muhammad or something. And so they would start coming in, posting all sorts of links to porn sites. So I went ahead and sure blocked, I went ahead and blocked anyone's ability to post links except like moderators. And so I, I don't see any. So I thought that it was blocked completely from the chat and that no one could see it. I don't see any, I have not seen one. So is you guys let me know, are you saying that what you see is completely different from mine, even though it's blocked from me seeing it, other people are still seeing it. And uh, also what happens when a moderator blocks it? Cause I'm not, I'm not in a position to block it because I don't see any of them. So what happens when you guys see it and a moderator blocks it? When a moderator blocks it, does everyone stop seeing it? Because uh, I have no idea what's going on because it's, it's, uh, it's invisible to me. Okay, never mind. Jer uh, Gerard Perry said they've been blocked. They're gone. Okay, so apparently they're blocked on my channel, but that only means what I can see right now. And so other people do see them, but the moderators have blocked them. And so, okay, Sam Harper said, I don't see any links. Uh, Donovan Hill said, seeing none. Uh, Brando said, I haven't seen. So apparently there are people who are like me. They haven't seen any. But other people are seeing them. So, all right, we'll figure that out. Maybe it's a, maybe, I don't know, maybe it's a, maybe it's a technical thing where it's, it's, the, these things are kind of coming through for certain people, but not for, uh, not for others. Cause a lot of people are saying they haven't seen any, but I'm looking right here and I see a lot of people saying that they're, uh, they're seeing them. So hopefully, hopefully that, uh, problem's been, okay. People directing them to our, our channel. All right. Mods always, always, always block, uh, anyone who's spamming anything, uh, about porn or, or anything else. All right. Um, I guess we'll, we should start wrapping up here. Um, what do you think, Braxton? Uh, it's just been a blast, David. I really appreciate this. I love talking about this argument. I don't care how many atheists say this is an old, tired, worn out argument that's been debunked. I haven't seen that debunking. And for my money, this is the best theistic argument, in my opinion, that things appeal to people differently. You know, a lot of people like the design arguments. Some people like the moral arguments. This is, this, this is the thing that if I ever do have an intellectual doubt this argument almost completely resolves it immediately, mm -hmm. um, at least in terms of God's existence. Because I, I just it it shocks me that anyone, after hearing and understanding this argument and the design argument, would still would 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 be an atheist. You, you may not be a Christian, but at least I don't know how you're still an atheist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I've noticed I noticed something similar with a lot of a lot of atheists, especially certain certain kinds of atheists. Now, now, guys, just to be clear, again, we've already said it, but. Since we've noticed that lots of atheists do misinterpret everything we say, um, there are atheists that are some of the most brilliant people I've ever met. Right? Um, I was at a, a philosophy conference and, and uh, just listening to a lot of Massimo Piglucci. That guy is smart. Oh, really, yeah. really, 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 really insanely smart. If you read one of his books, you you do not understand how smart this guy is until people are sitting there and raising objections and arguing with him and stuff. This guy's smart. Um, so we're, we're not, I'm not talking about people like that. Uh, there are a lot of much sloppier thinkers. What was funny was that was, in, that was a, that was a conference primarily of atheist philosophers who are complaining about how stupid a lot of the leaders of the new atheist movement were, right? So they're, they're basically saying, what do we do about this? These guys are like embarrassing. <laughs> These guys are so embarrassing, but they're the ones that are becoming popular. And we spend years trying to dissect arguments to get to the best case we can. And no one cares about that, but some guy just goes around blurting out these little atheist memes and slogans and atheists around the world uh, rally around. What, what, what do we do about this, right? Because they regarded it as, as massively, uh, massively embarrassing. But um, what you have is, uh, it's, I say it's, it's similar to something you have in Islam. Muslims. Many Muslims have never grasped the difference between successfully refuting an argument and, on the other hand, saying something in response to an argument, right? Those are two different things. One, I've refuted your argument. I've shown that premise one is false, or I've shown that premise two is false, or I've shown that the conclusion does not follow from the premises. I've shown something like that. That's how you refute an argument, or you just say, you know, I don't think you've proven this point or something like that. And therefore I can't, I can't accept the conclusion until you give a better case for that or something like that. But here are the problems with it. Doing something like that, right? What I find, what, what, what Muslims are, what Muslims often do is you give them an objection or an argument and their guy will say something in response to it. 
And his fans will just take that as a, as a decisive refutation. It doesn't matter. He could say the, comp the dumbest thing you've ever heard in your entire life. But as long as he has said something in response to it, they say, oh, you've refuted it. I've noticed a parallel among a certain kind of atheist that as long as the atheist speaker says something in response to what the Christian said, uh, it's a decisive refutation. I'm saying that because lots of people pointed out to me, um, I didn't watch the debate, but a lot of people pointed out to me that in order to avoid the claims of the disciples and so on, the witnesses of the risen Jesus, Matt made the claim, um, claims aren't evidence. Claims aren't evidence, right? And so that's the, and so his followers will go, that's right, claims aren't evidence, right? Without ever bothering to think and actually consider, is that a good response? Or is that the stupidest thing anyone has ever said? Claims aren't evidence. My goodness, why wasn't this the guy? Why wasn't this the lawyer for Bill Cosby and Harvey Weinstein and Jeffrey Epstein, right? Well, members of the jury, <laughs> these women, all these women are making these claims. But as we all know, claims aren't evidence. What evidence do they have apart from their claims? None. I rest my airtight case, right? <laughs> this guy would be like the ultimate lawyer for, for rapists, right? If he, if he could actually convince them of stuff like that and actually stack the jury with his followers, right? But they don't think about that, right? It's just anything you say that is a response to the Christian, we're 100% on board, case closed. Now we get to make fun of you for, uh, for trying to make a case, not realizing you're so dumb, you didn't understand that... that, that that claims aren't evidence, right? So that's what's going on with, with something like the Kalam cosmological argument is they'll say things, <laughs> they'll say things um, uh, to reject whether, you know, uh, something can, can come into existence without being caused or they'll say things about the universe not having a beginning, but not giving any real defense. And then as soon as they say anything, they just, up. Oh, we've refuted you. Up. Oh, I can't believe you're still bringing up that dumb argument. And then they'll all work themselves up into a frenzy of mockery. And once they've got that frenzy of mockery, it is very difficult to say, to get a word, uh, a reasonable word in edgewise, because now it's just a, it's just a fount of, of mockery and so on. And what can I say, man? That is, that seems to be modern atheism in a nutshell. Mockery is a very, very powerful thing. And, uh, you know, there has to be substance behind the mockery. And there is a lot of mock. I, I think I think there are some some YouTube atheists out there who are trying to grapple with. Well, Alex Malpass, who just debated Craig on capturing Christianity. This is this is a more sensible atheist who is aware of the philosophy. I mean, he's a philosopher. But the, but there's a lot of YouTube atheism out there that it's just rhetoric and mockery. And it's not all again, if the shoe doesn't fit, don't wear it. I'm not talking about you, but there's a lot of that out there. And I think that mockery is extremely effective, mm -hmm. especially with people who are doubting. Um, I, I've had people recently tell me they were they, they had serious doubts because of YouTube comments and the YouTube comments that they're pointing to. It's just mockery. It's mm -hmm. just rhetoric. So mockery is powerful. But if you're going to use it, have something behind it. Yeah, guys, uh, if you, you watch my channel, you know I'm all for mockery, but there's always <laughs> substance, right? The, the, the mockery is a vehicle, a package to get an important point across. There are other people who use mockery as a substitute for ever having a point, right? They don't have a point. They don't have an argument. They don't have a case. But if they mock enough, it sounds like they know what they're talking about, and, uh, and they just don't. Um, all right. Well, thank you, uh, Braxton, for joining me again, everyone. The, there's a link to Braxton's uh, YouTube channel in the description box. So he, he, how, often, how frequently do you, do you post? Once or twice a week? or how? Two or three times a week. Two or, two or three times a week. Mm -hmm. And uh, just, just, just describe the kind of content you make uh, for, for everyone. It's typically response videos to atheists. Um, it could be on any number of things, resurrection, philosophical arguments for God's existence. I stay away from like young earth creationism uh, when they're respond, when an atheist is attacking young earth, I don't really deal with that stuff, but, uh, the sort of things that we're talking about here and Bible stuff, but it's usually response videos to atheists. Mm -hmm. And, uh, John Beaver said, tell Braxton, I just brought, I just bought the Chronicles of the Adonai and have ah. read about three chapters so far. Awesome. That's my first volume of my fiction series. 
<laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I have several books, but I wrote a trilogy of, of fiction books that include apologetics. Oh, cool, cool, cool. All right, well, uh, thanks, everyone, for joining me. I will be back tomorrow, I believe, with Tony Costa and maybe someone else, and we will be addressing more. Also, later this week, uh, I think Thursday, I will have a victim of coronavirus live so we can actually all talk about coronavirus and what uh what it's like and and so on so anyway those will be coming up and uh again thanks to uh braxton hunter for joining us subscribe to the channel and catch you all next time